Hello everyone. Welcome to Prosto Hub and myself Dr. Joel Sna. So today we are going to start off with a new topic that is biomechanics of dental implants. The contents include introduction, natural tooth versus implant biomechanics, the different types of loads that is applied on the implants, the stress, strain, relationship and hook's law, the force delivery and failure mechanisms. fatigue failure scientific rationale for implant design single tooth implant biomechanics biomechanics in cantilever prosthesis and framework as well as misfit the treatment planning based on biomechanical risk factors and finally the conclusion and references so before getting into detail i request everyone to please do like and share my channel and if you like this video please do share it among your friends and if you have any queries topic suggestions feedbacks you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail id so let's start with the introduction so biomechanics is defined as the process of analysis and determination of loading and deformation of bone in a biological system that is it is a response of the biologic tissues to the applied loads and biomechanics comprises of all kinds of interaction between the tissues and organs of the body and the forces acting on them and we know that dental implants function to transfer the load to the surrounding biological tissues and so the primary functional design objective of an implant is to manage these biomechanical loads in order to optimize the implant supported prosthesis function and it is very important to understand and apply these biomechanical principle in each and every stage that is from the planning stage up to the final prosthetic restoration and ignoring them inevitably can lead to failure next let us see natural tooth versus implant biomechanics so in detail about this we have already discussed in our implant occlusion session so some of the points are natural tooth it's anchored into the bone by flexible periodontal ligament and which is the viscoelastic shock absorber which reduces the amount of stress transmitted to the bone whereas in case of implant there is no pdl it is rigidly fixed by functional ankylosis and the concentration of stresses in implant mainly occurs at the crestal region now again when there is a um, premature contact or an occlusal trauma there is precursor signs in case of natural teeth that is a cold sensitivity wear facets pits drift away and tooth mobility and these precursor signs are reversible that is they can be corrected by occlusal adjustment or a reduction in force magnitude which will reduce the stress magnitude whereas in case of implant the initial reversible signs and symptoms of trauma are totally absent and these stresses can result in bone microfracture bone loss which ultimately leads to mechanical failure of the implant components next the elastic modulus of a tooth is closer to the bone than any of the currently available dental implant biomaterial whereas in case of implant it differs by 5 to 10 times from the surrounding bone structure in case of elastic modulus now the greater the difference in this flexibility between the two material greater will be the potential relative motion generated between the two surfaces at the endosteel region next the proprioceptive information relayed by teeth and implant also differs in quality that is the tactile sensitivity is high for natural tooth that is it can sense up to 10 micrometer particles and it delivers a rapid sharp high pressure that triggers the proprioceptive mechanism whereas in case of implant the tactile sensitivity is less that is it can detect only up to 25 micrometer particles and implants deliver a slow dull pain that triggers a delayed reaction if any the next the surrounding bone of natural tooth is developed slowly and gradually in response to these biomechanical loads whereas in case of implant the bone formation is performed by the dentist in a much more rapid and intense fashion next is about the lateral force so when there is a lateral force on natural tooth it is dissipated rapidly away from the crest of the bone towards the apex of the tooth that is the fulcrum to the lateral force is at the apical third and this mechanism reduces the crestal loads and when there is a lateral force there is 
a rapid primary movement of 56 to 108 micrometer in case of natural teeth. Whereas in case of implant, the lateral force gets concentrated at the crestal region. This is because there is no primary rapid movement of the implant. Only it exhibits a secondary movement that is only up to 10 to 50 micrometer. This again causes concentration of stress at the crestal region. So whenever there is an occlusal trauma, the tooth moves to dissipate these stresses and strains. And after the offending trauma is eliminated, tooth returns back to its original position within the limits of magnitude of movement that has taken place. Whereas in case of implant, mobility can take place under occlusal trauma, but when the offending trauma is eliminated, an implant rarely returns back to its original position, but instead its failure occurs. So these are some of the points in under natural tooth versus implant biomechanics. To know in detail, you can watch the implant occlusion session one. The load applied on implants. So excess load on an osseointegrated implant may result in mobility of the supporting device or it may fracture an implant component or body. So under function, there is occlusal load, whereas when there is absence of function, perioral forces can ha happen. That is a frequent horizontal loads and also mechanical loads on abutment due to a non-passive processes. So biomechanics help us to understand such physiologic and non-physiologic load and we can determine which type of load renders more risk. And the goal of treatment planning should be to minimize and evenly distribute the mechanical stress in implant system and contiguous bone. Now, let us see the three basic methods of loading in an implant. So, loading simply means applying a force to an object. And there are three basic methods of loading in biomechanics. First one is compression, which involves a stress that compacts the structure. So, compression compacts the structure, whereas tension, it involves pulling the structure apart. And finally, shear involves pushing the structure eccentrically and the torsional loading involves twisting of a structure. However, when seen in cross section, torsional loading is essentially the same as shear for an individual unit of the structure. So these different means of loading substantially impact the way a structure behaves. And for bones, these loading characteristics produces different but predictable fracture patterns. That is the compressive forces compresses an object whereas tensile forces pulls the objects apart and shear forces on implant causes sliding. Now let us see the features of compression. So these compressive forces tends to push the mass towards each other and it maintains integrity of bone implant interface. And this is the one which is accommodated best. That is cortical bone is strongest under compression and the cements, retention screws, implant components and bone implant interfaces can accommodate greater compressive forces than tensile or shear forces. And so compressive forces should be the dominant one in implant prosthetic occlusion. So the compressive forces helps to maintain the integrity of bone implant interface, whereas the tensile as well as shear forces tends to distract or disrupt such an interface. So shear forces are most destructive, that is cortical bone is weakest to accommodate shear forces. So these forces should be less, whereas compressive forces should be the dominant one in implant prosthetic occlusion. Next, let us see the stress strain relationship. So what is stress and strain? They are terms used to describe the ability of an object to withstand external forces. So when a force is applied to a material, the internal structure of the material undergoes certain changes which is calculated by formula force per unit area and that is called as stress. Whereas the deformation of material caused by the external force is called as strain. Now a relationship is needed between the applied stress that is imposed on the implant and surrounding tissue and the subsequent deformation which is given by the stress strain curve. And here comes the significance of Hooke's law. So what is Hooke's law? Hooke's law dictates that stress is directly proportional to strain. So here you can see that initially, so initially in this graph, this obeys the Hooke's law, that is stress is directly proportional to strain. And 
once a certain strain is reached the material begins to deform so here you can see once the certain strain is reached the material begins to deform and it will no longer assume its original shape when the stress is released and this point is called as the yield point so here you can see up to this stage the material shows elastic behavior but after the yield point the material shows plastic behavior and at the end this point is called as the failure point where fracture or failure of the material occurs so hooke's law is the basis for predicting the biomechanical properties of implants so hooke's law states that stress and strain are directly proportional and that is seen at the initial portions of a stress strain curve now a number defines the relationship between stress and strain for a given material during this linear aspect of the stress strain curve and that is the young's modulus of elasticity so stress is equal to modulus of elasticity into strain so basically the modulus of elasticity or the young's moduli describes the elasticity of a material and it is calculated by dividing stress by strain or visually it is the slope of the line created on the stress strain curve through the elastic portion of the curve and components with high moduli are stiff like stainless steel on the other hand low moduli means soft materials like ultra high molecular weight polyethylene which is used in orthopedics as per the stress strain relationship once a particular implant system is selected the only way for an operator to control the strain experienced by tissue is to control the applied stress or change the density of bone around the implant so we have already said in a previous slide that closer the modulus of elasticity of the implant to the biological tissue the less the relative motion at the implant tissue interface next let us understand the manner in which forces are applied to the dental implant restoration and also the failure mechanism these are important to avoid complications so here comes the importance of moment or torque so what is moment or torque it is the force which tends to rotate a body so in addition to axial force there is a moment on the implant which is equal to the magnitude of force multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the center of the implant so in this picture you can see that this is the line of action of force this is the perpendicular distance and here the moment of torque is calculated by the formula f multiplied by d that is the distance between line of action and center of implant multiplied by the magnitude of force now the moment loads can be destructive in nature and may result in implant bone interface breakdown bone resorption screw loosening and bar or bridge fracture now there are three clinical coordinate axes and a total of six moments may develop about the three clinical coordinate axes so here you can see in the picture they are occluso apical facio lingual and mesio distal so these are the three clinical coordinate axes and a total of six moments may develop around these and these moment loads induce micro rotations and stress concentration at the crest of the alveolar ridge at the implant to tissue interface and which leads inevitably to crestal bone loss and there are also three clinical moment arms in implant industry that is occlusal height cantilever length and occlusal width now let us see these three clinical moment arms in detail among the three clinical moment arms the first one that is the occlusal height which serves as the moment arm for force components directed along the facio lingual axis and mesio distal axis now the force component along the vertical axis it's not affected by the occlusal height because there is no effective moment arm so when there is a force that is directed along the vertical axis the perpendicular distance between line of action of force and center of implant is zero and so there is no effective moment arm however uh, the lateral loads can introduce significant moment arms and in case of division a bone 
the initial moment arm at the crest is less than that of division C or D bone because the crown height it's greater in division C or D bone. So the treatment planning must take into account this initially compromised biomechanical environment. Next, the second clinical moment arm that is cantilever length. So cantilever or horizontal offset we have already discussed in detail in our implant protective occlusion session 3. So we know that cantilever processes are the ones which are fixed at only one end and cantilever extensions or offset loads from rigidly fixed implant results in large moment load. So here is a picture that illustrates uh, two implants that are placed 10 millimeter apart. So these are two implants placed 10 millimeter apart and the cantilever distance is 20 millimeter. So when there is an when there is a situation like this when two implants are designed 10 millimeter apart splintered with a cantilever of 20 millimeter when a force of 25 lbs is applied on the cantilever it is resisted by 50 lbs force on the mesial implant and the distal implant which act as a fulcrum has got a force of 75 lbs so here it is a condition that is similar to a class 1 liver and the mechanical advantage is calculated to be so to know in detail, you can watch the session three of implant protective occlusion. And another greatest determinant for the length of cantilever is the magnitude of force. So patients with severe bruxism should not undergo restoration with any cantilevers regardless of other factors. Another important determinant is the anterior posterior spread. So this is the distribution distance between the most anterior and most posterior implant. So this is called as the anterior posterior spread and greater the anterior posterior spread smaller the resultant loads on the implant system from the cantilevered forces because of the stabilizing effect of the anterior posterior distance. So uh, as per mesh the amount of stress will be less when you increase the anterior posterior spread that is force by area when the area increases the force decreases so in biomechanically compromised environments such as poor quality bone the strain to the crustal bone can be reduced by increasing the anterior posterior spread of the implant and an anterior posterior spread that minimizes the distal cantilever and establishes well distributed four point stability will probably contribute to both implant as well as prosthetic success and uh, clinical experiences suggest that distal cantilever should not exceed 2.5 times the anterior posterior spread under ideal conditions. Now let us see the recommendations by MISH. So cantilever length is determined by the amount of stress applied to the system. And generally distal cantilever should not exceed 2.5 times the anterior posterior spread. Patients with para function should not be restored by cantilever regardless of other factors. Square arch form involves smaller anterior posterior spread between splintered implant and should have smaller length cantilever and tapered arch form can be restored with larger anterior posterior spread and large cantilever design. The next clinical moment arm is occlusal width. So widening the occlusal table greater will be the force developed to penetrate a bolus of food and also a restoration that mimics the occlusal anatomy of natural teeth often results in offset load and also there is increased risk of porcelain fracture. So wide occlusal table increases the moment arm for any offset occlusal load and so in order to reduce the rotation or facial tipping you can either narrow the occlusal table or adjust the occlusion to provide more centric contacts. So to summarize, a vicious destructive cycle can develop with the moment loads which can result in crestal bone loss. So once there is a crestal bone loss, automatically the occlusal height increases. And once this occlusal height moment arm increase, there is increased facial angle micro rotation and rocking which again causes more stress to the crustal bone which results in crustal bone loss. So unless the bone increase in density and strength this cycle continues and results in implant failure 
if this biomechanical environment is not corrected. Next is fatigue failure, which is characterized by dynamic cyclic loading conditions. So there are four fatigue factors that significantly influence the likelihood of fatigue failure in implant industry. And they are biomaterials, macro geometry, force magnitude and number of loading cycles. So we have to discuss this in detail and we will be continuing this in our next session. So thank you all for watching my video. Please do like, share and subscribe my channel Prosto Hub if you are finding these videos useful and if you have any queries, topic suggestions or feedbacks, you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So it's bye from Prosto Hub until our next session. Thank you all once again.